LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Neil Kramer, who joins us to discuss his current book, The Unfoldment, The Organic Path to Clarity, Power and Transformation. Uh, the Unfoldment presents a body of sacred wisdom and a deep spiritual perspective that puts real power and real magic into the hands of those who seek a path of awakening. Uh, the author draws on a lifetime of spiritual encounters and experiential gnosis to formulate a unique synthesis of metaphysics, mysticism and esoteric knowledge which provides genuine, hands-on tools and teachings for transformation and enlightenment in the 21st century. Hello and welcome Neil Kramer and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hi Greg, it's good to be with you. Now, Neil, we're here today uh, in general to discuss your recent book, uh, The Unfoldment, uh, which uh, subtitle is The Organic Path to Clarity, Power and Transformation. Uh, before we dive right into it, perhaps you could just give listeners a little overview um, of what the book's dealing with. Sure. The book is um, an exposition, really, of a modern journey of awareness, wisdom and esoterica. So um, it's my attempt, in a way, to breach an audience of people who are interested in um, an alternative view of the universe and maybe know a little bit about metaphysics, maybe know some science, some quantum physics, maybe a little mysticism, maybe they're also interested in spirituality. And this is my sort of contemporary synthesis of a number of those things, but with a particular... Um, focus on philosophy and mysticism, which for me go pretty close together, pretty hand in hand. And I think that um, some of the material that I use in it from uh, a very controversial sources and from the ancient world, and as I say, very esoteric stuff, is like frighteningly pertinent to some of the mess that we find ourselves in today, politically and military and corporate and all kinds of problems with personal freedom and legislation that tips the balance in favor of um, corporations rather than individuals. So there's a very practical reflection of this philosophical text in our day-to-day -day lives. And anybody who is familiar with what I do, and for those who don't, I pretty much insist that any philosophy must be infused into the felt experience of what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just like some nice ideas in a page. It's different ways of actually being, different ways of actually creating different realities. So it is a transformative book, and obviously the publishers put their spin on it to make some sales and get it in front of people, which is fair enough. But it is quite transformative, and the reports I'm hearing back from a lot of the people reading it are, are finding that, in that if you really go into it, and you really kind of go into the various layers of the book, um, it changes things, and uh, that pleases me. Well, it absolutely does. Now, the thing that, that drew me into it initially when I just uh, picked it up and I kind of turned it over and then you know, opened it, whatever, a random page, was things that I'd been grappling with all my life. And there were the big three questions in my mind, and, and perhaps universally, so why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And you describe in the book how the pattern that so many of us seem to live, particularly in, in the industrialized uh, world, but that pattern that will be familiar to us all of work, rest, eat, sleep, repeat. And then the realization <laughs> of sort of saying to yourself, what is this for? And this is something I asked myself when I was at school. Why are we doing this? And then that leads you into the realm of philosophy by its you know, definition it does. 
And those three big questions that we might come to ponder, uh, that you expand upon at length and in all sorts of interesting directions in the book, we have no time to contemplate these because work, rest, eat, sleep, repeat takes over. Yeah, absolutely. And that um, is the fundamental sort of pivot of the whole book, really, which is one sits back from life and, you know, you have a moment of repose and you just ask yourself, what is this all for? What What is this for? What is this existence for? And I found it as a young man unacceptable um, that the answer was, well, nothing really. And I also found it unacceptable to say, well, to pass on genetic material, which is the sort of, you know, um, very, very reductionist scientific perspective. And I, I found those not necessarily um, uncomfortable. I kind of wouldn't care necessarily for some reason, but just unsatisfactory. I don't I didn't buy that as, as a very young person. So. One goes on various journeys and you have late night conversations and you read a few books. And for a lot of people, that's maybe how it continues. And you, as you say, with the industrial Protestant work ethic of go to work and be productive and shut your mouth, you don't have a lot of time for contemplation. And again, that's something that for whatever reason, I chose to reject that restriction. And so I did everything I could <clears throat> to create an existence, a life where I created the time to uh, examine and look at those questions in a serious way, not in a necessarily academic way or an overly scholarly way, but in a very human way to think, right, I am going to actually think as best I can and penetrate this mystery of what the hell this is all about, what's going on, particularly because having lived in England for 35 years until I moved to the States uh, in, in recent times, uh, England had become a fascist state. And I don't think there's any argument against that anymore. And the only surprise at that is how cleverly it's crept upon people. And I think it's the same in many places in Germany and France and Italy and Scandinavia. And I thought, that's odd. You know, that's that's like a very stark contrast to some of the intelligence and enlightenment and capabilities and capacity we have for thought and creation and constructive ways of being. And yet here the government structures are squeezing more and more out of people, leaving them with less and less. And I, I felt that was very, as I describe it, inorganic, very un, unnatural. I don't think that is what normally happens when human beings are left to their own devices. So this book is my synthesis of why that's happened and what we can do about it. And to, to put it uh, in a nutshell, what you can do about it is transform yourself because that is how you transform everything around you. So every time you speak to somebody, do something, pay a bill, you know, go to the laundrette, go to the you know the the corner shop whatever if your consciousness <clears throat> is operating at a higher level that has a physical effect on the world around you which again I go into the details of how and why that is and you don't even have to open your mouth necessarily it's not like we're going to suddenly become preachers and go around trying to wake people up and all that nonsense i i totally disagree with that i encourage people to entirely play their own game and get on with their own stuff and their own unfoldment as it were their own awakening their own process of development but as you do that you realize that you start to magnetize experiences that are um, complementary to that i.e. you meet certain kinds of people you go on certain sorts of journeys certain breaks uh, good breaks come your way and again there's that um, synchronous aspect to the journey and plus the fact and this is something that I'm very keen on uh, extrapolating from uh, the process of awakening which is a lifelong process it doesn't necessarily ping into somebody's head at any time it takes uh, a long long time on that journey the world becomes more magical which is a very unfashionable and funny thing to say in post-industrial Europe and America magic you know it's a funny word isn't it and yet 
undeniably, as I've gone about my journey, I have seen more magical things and experienced more paradoxical events than is due to a normal guy my age from my background. It's just unbelievable. So the world beckons people who go on this process of discovery. It says, yeah, this is actually what it's for. This is what it's for. It's for growth. It's for evolution. And I feel that the universe is doing that itself. The universe is evolving and growing. And when it sees someone else evolving and growing, it supports them in that. And it says, hey, when you're aligned, when you calibrate yourself to the same thing, we can support each other. So as I often say, the first time the universe sees you is when you start your own process of ascendance, of awakening, of personal development, of inner discovery, whatever you want to call it. The real stuff of being a human being and asking the big questions and actually doing something about it puts you in a harmonic relationship for the first time with the universe and then it reveals more of itself to you. Now this, the, the, those ideas basically tie in with the notion of there being of everything being connected and it's in um, I can't remember it's quite early on in the book you speak of the concept of there being one universal truth and this is something that that really resonated with me and I think probably does with a lot of other people um, the idea that there's a fundamental um, order or even fundamental chaos but there's there, there are patterns in reality and in the universe and in existence that are telling us something and that, as you say, we're more than just passengers in this. And, uh, well, perhaps you could just say something about that concept of one universal truth because it was, it was very powerful. Yeah, I think in a in a modern landscape where we have so much media and internet and magazines and TV stations and cable and satellite and there's this huge miasma of images and so much choice in quotes, so many things to select from that um, from that kind of panorama of, of images that you tend to feel that the whole thing is just very subjective and all, it's all relative. And what's true for me is not for you and what's true for this guy is not for this girl, whatever. And the whole thing becomes kind of like you scratch your head and think, well, if it's all relative, it's all subjective and it doesn't sort of really count for much. You know, what's going on? Is, is there no guiding principle? Is there no truth? And that, again, is a, is a very uh, inescapably spiritual observation. And when you go back to the texts of our forefathers in the um, late modern period and in the medieval period and in the ancient world, there is this observation that there's this single uh, truth that emanates from the source of everything and mystically speaking they call it the all christians would call it of course god um and this source this divinity again another unpopular word these days kind of emanates from inception throughout everything and the truth in a in a way is contact with that divinity and it doesn't come into any sort of theology or scripture at all really this divinity is something that almost physical that you can make contact with and when you do it has a, a sensation of truth and as i say you can see it on very mundane levels in people's lives and with all those wonderful things that humans do well like play and create and have compassion and love and be constructive and give you know um, high conduct with each other you can feel a truth in that and the flip side, you can feel an untruth when you look at uh, David Cameron and Barack Obama and Angela Merkel and all these, you know, very sad human beings. You, you can feel the untruth in it. And what that actually means is you can feel the distance from the organic divine pattern. You can feel how far away some systems, some intelligences, some people, some things have drifted from their organic, true, authentic nature, which is to be an amazing, totally independent, sovereign, creative spirit with absolutely no authority over you at all, none. Because that sovereignty within us is a divine thing, is a pure thing. And the only thing that distances us from it is our own 
mental distortions about who we are and what we're doing, which are kind of augmented and falsely amplified by the mainstream construct, as I call it, which is education, your mums and dads, knowledge that they've passed on, you know, with good intentions, but is misleading. The school system, uh, colleagues, work, industry, the corporate environment, all those things distance men and women from what they actually are. It completely removes any notion of uh, truth from life. Truth becomes completely irrelevant and unimportant, almost like a little fanciful luxury. And I, as hopefully I'm getting across here, I'm equating truth with a kind of pureness from the beginning of the universe, from the inception point of the universe. And one word for that is divinity. And if you live an untrue life, if you live an inauthentic life doing things that are crap, that make you unhappy, that are far from your nature, then you drift from that truth and you begin to have insincere uh, interactions in your life and that becomes you know endemic at certain points and certainly in Britain and America that as that is the case most people lead very inauthentic lives to some degree that's understandable and to some degree you could say it's through no fault of their own that's how the system's set up is to distance people from truth from what is real uh, the unfoldment, therefore, as I put it, my little spin on this process of liberation, is a very radical act. It's the most radical thing you can do, which is separate yourself from that system while still being part of it. So it's like saying, OK, well, I'm in it. I have to do certain things while I'm in the system. I have to pay certain dues, as it were. However, my mentality and my soul and my spirit, I am going to reclaim ownership of that and totally do something different and behave in a different way and think in a different way and do something different. So you change the game. The game isn't have nice stuff and live as long as you can anymore. That's not the game. The game is behave and perceive and act with as much truth and honor and sovereign power as you possibly can on a moment by moment basis and that's that's what my uh, book is basically talking about now whether there have been other you know world ages um, or not whatever we come to understand by that it seems that the, the age that we're currently living in there is um, deep and growing dissatisfaction uh, in people's lives uh, whatever sort of human society they live in uh, whether they're in poverty or whether they're in relative wealth and coming Alongside this, there seems to be an acceleration of awareness um, as people become more conscious of some of the things that you're speaking about. Now, this is not universal. It's, it's certainly uneven. And to some extent, I see humanity almost going in, in two different directions, some becoming more deeply unconscious, while others appear to be waking up a little bit like the, uh, the Morlocks and the Eloy in, in H.G. Uh, Wells' Time Machine. But we're, something is certainly ha happening in terms of global uh, consciousness and this emerging awareness uh, of some of the things uh, of which you speak. And this is causing um, a lot of schism and conflict uh, in and of it itself, I think. It is. And I think that uh, schism or the word that's often used to describe it, that bifurcation of the species, a split in the species is to some degree can be explained by saying that when you externalize your own problems you get it wrong and when you externalize what's wrong with the human story and you try and point a finger or blame something or someone outside yourself then you end up going in the wrong direction I would say so the people who are drifting further and further into darkness into unconsciousness because all as we might call it, evil, or all darkness is really a result of the pain of unconsciousness, of not knowing what's going on and not having any power to do anything in your own life and in your own being. When you're in that state, you are externalizing the problem. And the problem is not an external problem, it's an internal one, which you can only do something about for yourself, which is to be to begin with it's a very simple thing which sounds funny but it's, it's very important which is to take ownership of yourself and to treat yourself seriously as a very sacred uh, adventurer on this planet you're not just here by accident 
you're not just here to do uh, a job in an office or a job in a factory. You're here to do something pretty amazing, which is help the universe to see itself, help articulate this massive creation, this awesome, extravagant, ornate creation, and help to perceive it, to witness it, and in many cases to create with it, to be part of that creation. Because as has been observed many times, we're not really separate from it. There isn't really a gap between oneself and the world. That gap doesn't exist. It's purely theoretical. So when you start to remove that gap and say, really, energy is flowing through us and from us and into us all the time, it's one system. It's one kind of huge um, energetic quantum membrane. And that is a very powerful observation because you begin to realize that even your own little private intimate thoughts and dreams and desires have an effect they actually have an effect on the world. You're not separate from the world. You are very closely bound to it. And when you feel that way, then you start to change what's going on around you. So there is a there is a tide of awareness, um, and there is a tide of um, how can I put it? Uh, decision making, where people think right. I'm going to do something about this. I can't live like this anymore. This inauthentic, crappy life that, you know, Cameron and Obama are suggesting what we need is jobs. We don't want jobs. Nobody wants a job. That's the last thing we want. We don't want democracy because it's a lie. That doesn't work. It's it's nonsense. We don't want socialism or communism or capitalism. All those All those things, we don't want them. So what they're putting forward as what we want is not true. And people come to that and think, well, where the hell does that leave us? What what do we do about that? You know, do we become activists? Do we do Occupy Wall Street? Do we go out and throw, you know, Molotov cocktails through bank windows? You know, what, what do we do? What we do is realize that that problem emanates from within every single one of us. The darkness of the world at the moment is kind of a game at a very high level, but at the the basic level where we are, it's a very important game and it's a very real game. And what it's telling us is that, hey guys, you humans have drifted from your authentic nature. And when you do that, you externalize the world and your technology becomes plastic and silicon and glass and chrome and silver. And that isn't real true technology. Real technology is always in a technology which is pure energy at its pure level. So in the ancient worlds, which we're not allowed to talk about, which are just mythologized now, but in my studies absolutely existed and absolutely had a reality just as firm and as concrete as ours. In those ancient worlds, the great uh, discrepancy, the great differentiation between theirs and ours is that their technology was largely internal. It didn't necessarily, you didn't need machines and file servers and computers and iPhones and smartphones and pads and goodness knows what. All that stuff takes you away from your nature. And so while it's useful, and indeed we're using part of that technology to have and record this conversation, um, it isn't really the authentic thing that human beings can do. We can do this without the technology. We don't need the technology. And it's a symptom of where we've gone wrong. And the the big problem is that this, as I call it, this control system that suppresses human beings just to keep them easy to look after. And, the, you know, it's been going on since the Romans and the Egyptians, and there is only one empire. There are no warring factions. There is one empire that creates little, um, f you know, fractious uh, wars here and there that look very bad all the time, and millions of people die with it. Well, that's kind of like a smokescreen. Really what the control system is doing is saying, keep human beings as dumb and silly and confused as possible because they're easy to govern when you can do that. And that is coming to a breaking point now because people have frankly had enough of it and they're beginning to see through it. And even the most dyed-in-the-wool conservative or Republican or Democrat or Labour voter can sense now that it doesn't really matter who's in uh, number 10 who's in you know the white house it doesn't really matter and it's all kind of like 
a business and at the top level they're all sort of talking to each other and you know there is a conspiratorial element to that and we can disappear down that rabbit hole if we're not careful which is not advisable that is part of the study but it's not the whole thing being a conspiracy theorist or researcher is a very very small part of the journey i'd say it's about five percent of the process and if you get stuck in that it can create problems and a lot of dissatisfaction and fear in people it's a very simple observation that that the system is set up against you yes it is and the people in number 10 are not representing the citizens correct they're not representing the citizens that is a fact and if one cares to analyze it you soon come to that conclusion which once again puts the onus puts the responsibility firmly back with ourselves and unfortunately a lot of people don't want to take that responsibility they want daddy to do it for them or they want the big man to go away and do it somebody in a suit who knows loads of things to go and look after everything that has to stop you have to start doing things for yourself now the the, the other human beings or other entities or uh, that make up um, seem to be in control of uh, constructed participating in the system that we've just spoken about that is manipulating and corralling and restraining um humanity and consciousness are they the same is it the same are they on the same journey is it all part of the same energy because in the book you, you speak about the age-old concept of earth as a sort of spiritual training ground so perhaps um we're being tested here because we also think about the wheel of karma and perhaps that their ultimate goal is to um is to get out of here you know, perhaps where this is one, how can I put it, compartment in, a, in, I don't know, in a mansion that we're moving through. We've moved from the smaller one and now we're in this one and our job is to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah, I, I think it is. And I formulate as the um, theosophists and as the Sufis and as the Rosicrucians and as the Druids did, I too formulate seven densities, seven worlds, seven realms through which we move. And we're in the third realm at the moment, the third density. And within that, one of the very essential parts of the training, parts of the development, is to be a homo sapien, to be a human being on Earth in the 3D, right now in the 21st century for us. And it's a university of spiritual evolution, and you come here to learn stuff, and you come into time and physicality and materiality, so you can see the effects of your consciousness on the world around you. That's what time and cause and effect is for for is to slow things down to show you the effect of your mind on the world around you that's what it's for you stay here for as long as is necessary before you let us say graduate so if you're thick and you don't try very hard and all you're doing is trying to get a mercedes in a nice big six bedroom house you've gone wrong You've taken the wrong path. That's not the game. That's not what you're supposed to be doing here. In fact, it's the opposite of the game because it moves against evolution. It moves against consciousness. It moves against growth, that way of living. It doesn't do anything. So the sort of um, innovators that are held up, like um, you know the Apple guys and the Facebook guys and the Microsoft guys and the dot-com people are very poor examples of growing human beings even with the sprinkling of meditation and zen and whatnot that some of them claim very poor examples you know they they are people who are doing the opposite of growth the opposite of development for me um what's particularly uh, relevant in today's world is to make a decision to some degree to put things in perspective and say right at a very high level i agree with you this is kind of like a game it is an assistance to say okay let's make the chessboard let's make the world so dark and weird and discordant and disturbing that people can't sleep anymore it's not like the 1950s where we're all eating you know apple pie perhaps you can tell i've been in america all right <laughs> shepherd's pie all right shepherd's pie and um we're just having a nice thing and that you can leave your front door open and we've got a great job and we, you know, we're doing this and we're doing that and driving around in shiny cars. That, that's not possible anymore. You can't even retire now anymore. 
you can't even create a decent pension anymore. There's no money for any of that stuff. It doesn't work. This, the the system is broken. You know, in the states, fractional reserve banking is broken. You go into a trillion dollars of debt every year here. It doesn't work anymore. All that stuff. The government people can't be trusted. The corporations can't be trusted. You know, all the technology is kind of crap, really. Very dehumanizing, I think. And that's funny at a very high level. That's that's a funny thing because it's like the dial's been turned up on the obligation and the compulsion to awaken. So you cannot sleep in that world anymore. If you do, you're going to need to pop pills or get, you know, drunk every night or sleep around every night or something to distract you. Some Do something to distract you. Play golf, you know, drive your car, you know, very fast on the motorway, whatever. But there's no way you can sleep in this world anymore. It is pushing consciousness further and further to the precipice to say, right, it's do or die now, baby. You can't just sleepwalk through this nonsense and this drudgery this soul crushing bloody drudgery anymore you can't do it and that makes people do their own study and their own research and ask the big questions and inevitably that leads people to another funny word to use these days spirituality which really uh, we could we, we tend to swap that word now for consciousness that's the new word for that um and it's questions of metaphysics, i.e., how does how does this place hang together? What's it for? Where does it come from? Uh, science doesn't deliver the answers. Um, Christianity and Judaism and Islam don't deliver the answers. Uh, alchemy, spirituality of the old world, uh, mysticism, the ancient mystery schools, don't deliver all the answers. And you soon find that the only way to do it is to kind of do it for yourself and say, well, there's some answers in some places and they're scattered around. They're kind of buried here and there. And there is some in the sacred texts. There is some in psychology. There is some in philosophy. There is some in mysticism. But it's not exclusively. There's not one magic book or one magic key or one special moment where you go, aha, there we go. The mystery solved because there'd be no point in this university then. So the solution is your journey. The solution through this and out through the other side of this amazing setup is to go on your journey. And that will lead you, particularly for me, into philosophy and mysticism. Basically, people who have said, I'm going to think seriously about what's going on. That's all those things mean to me. And when we say mysticism, we think of bloody mystic Meg, don't we? Sat in a little room with a Mm. a black dress on and doing tarot cards or something i'm not talking about that i'm talking about very serious men and women over the last two three thousand years who've sat down and thought about this who've gone into the world and thought about this who've made epic journeys and thought about this and come to some very interesting conclusions and made some very provocative and radical observations that are so unheard of so forbidden in this post-industrial landscape that we're in today that it's hilarious so sometimes you have to kind of keep your mouth shut about the way it is because it's so opposed to the way we told it is it's startling really and that's what puts a lot of people off because once you start to sniff the truth of what's going on initially it looks very bleak and weird but that soon passes and it becomes very vast and magical and almost dare i say tolkien-esque when you get to that point even so It's scary because for a lot of people, it means that they realize that the way they've been living, what they've been doing, who they've been with and the things that they've been investing in in their life is all going to change. And that's a big ask for a lot of people to say, if you want to know the truth about this world and how vast and magical it is, it's going to change you. Are you ready for that? And for a lot of people, the answer is, I don't think so. (laughs) <laughs> well, this is a direct, this is why The Matrix is such a powerful piece of, you know, pop culture, really, I think. And uh, you can, you know, almost every scene in that film, every line of dialogue holds some sort of truth, some sort of key in it. And I don't quite know how that occurred or why, but it's very much a case of, you know, people you're referring to is, are they ready to be unplugged from The Matrix? And for a lot of that's, people, that's exactly right. yeah, yeah th- th- they're not because it, um, you, you can't go back. That's for one. Um, unlike, yeah. unlike in the film. 
yeah, and that's 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 an issue. I mean, I have seen one or two people come into the the real world if we want to talk about it in that way, and and then turn back and say no, it's too weird and scary because it puts complete and total uh, responsibility on yourself. You have to do everything for yourself. You have to decide what's true for yourself. You can't read it in. Uh, new scientist or nature magazine you can't get it in a textbook at oxford university or cambridge or here or there or harvard you can't do that you have to begin to trust yourself that only you can know what's true um and again that's that's something that we're not familiar with that notion you think well i can't know little me i can't know what's true and people tend to have a very uh, low opinion of themselves and have very low self-worth and very low self-esteem. So the other side of uh, this book, The Unfoldment, is to just get rid of that nonsense straight away and saying, look, that that's not true. Every human being has equal capacity to be totally awesome and totally insightful and naturally philosophical. It's a very natural human impulse, I think, to love wisdom, because that's what the word means. Um Philo is to love, and uh, Soph, Sophia is uh, wisdom, and that's that's what philosophy is—a love of wisdom, and that's something that everybody really is interested in. Everybody loves that, but we've been asked to uh, perceive that as a luxury or as a little uh, sideshow, where really that's the main event. That's all that it's about. That's the impulse that guides us to be in better men and women. And at a personal development level, if nothing else, it, it gives you higher conduct, higher integrity and authenticity in what you do. And um, the, that development side of it just sharpens your game and makes life more enjoyable and gives yourself permission to stop doing the stuff that you don't want to do anymore and create a situation where you can start doing more of what you want to do. And again, that is considered a rare luxury, is it not, in this world, to say, well, here's someone who spends a lot of time doing what they want to do. You know, you think, well, who, who can do that? Mark Zuckerberg or Richard Branson, maybe. No, they're, they're not doing at all what they want to do, in my view. Uh, what you want to do, the real wealth of the world is measured in time, not uh, material wealth, necessarily. And it is possible, it is a functional operational reality to create a life where you can spend time doing the things you want to do and that's what we're supposed to be doing so um and this you know i speak as someone who spent many 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 years laboring uh in a situation which wasn't awful which was my own choosing in offices and wearing my shirt and tie and suit and whatnot um but i started to realize that that was a choice that was a choice that i was making and that is a massive realization because you don't think it's a choice. You think, well, we have to do this, don't we? We've all got to do this. We've all got to earn a crust. We've all got to do something we don't like to bring in the bacon. You know, that's not true. That is actually totally not true. You don't have to do that. But you have to do something uh, to counterbalance it, to offset that of tremendous truth and sincerity and value that is very closely aligned with your own uh, self-discovery. That's the situation where the universe will say, OK, I'll let you do that thing that you want to do. I'll let you live that kind of life you want to do. But you've got to be good, boy. You've got to be sharp and you've got to be true all the time. Uh, you can't just, you know, sit back and play video games and, you know, read comics or whatever. That's not really uh, acceptable. That's play. And you're not here to play. You're not here to be happy even. Those things come along on the journey definitely human beings are playful human beings do happiness very well but that's not the point of being here those are byproducts of correct function the correct function is to grow and is, is to evolve and is to graduate from here and go on to the next adventure the problem at the moment is the suppression has got so ridiculous so funny so hilarious so bizarre and surreal that no one's graduating anymore or very few and we've got seven billion dimwits all wandering about scratching their head wondering what's going on and all the you know uh, the third world countries are trying to be like britain and america were in the 1960s and 70s now industrializing and doing all this nonsense and it, it's funny it's funny how that sweeps around the planet and very very few people are sitting together 
are getting together and making the time to talk about substantial things. And yet, as you pointed out before, those who are doing are doing it to a new degree of quality and to a greater degree of clarity that is very encouraging, is very heartwarming. So it is difficult not to say that some people are drifting deeper into unconsciousness whilst others are moving to truth and awakening and higher consciousness, a better world, better people, more natural, organic, human, powerful beings, not some nip, you know, dippy, new age rubbish this. This is proper human beings living well. That's all we're talking about here. Well, we're about to find out. Um, I <clears throat> suspect in a very few generations, possibly much sooner than that, what we are capable of or not capable of because the system, we can see it unraveling around us, it's allowed people to stay asleep, is going away. So one way or another, we're going to have a bucket of cold water poured over us. And it's just a question of when we blink ourselves awake, uh, what we then do. Do we run around screaming like headless chickens or do we say, OK, you know, show me the matrix. And right. We just got to get on and get up. Well, that's right. And that's one of my little phrases that the old world is going away and it is going away. And all those images of 1950s Britain and America, which really are still the sort of emblem and still the sort of ambition for a lot of people and governments and businesses. It's nonsense. That was a, a time of really unthinkable unconsciousness, the 1950s, unthinkable stupidity in human beings. Very pleasurable, admittedly, in many ways, if you had a few quid. Very pleasurable, but that isn't what we're here for. That's, again, just something that comes along the way. And if you do it right, you can enjoy a lot of pleasure and happiness and smiles and laughs and cool stuff along the way. But that's not what it's for. And that's where people went wrong. And in the 80s, they were trying to get back to that. Just think like, how can I have loads of leisure time, loads of cash, you know, three cars, big TV, whatever. How can I do all that? And it got very stupid and materialist. And that uh, post sort of um, materialist shock drifted throughout the following decade throughout the 90s and the 90s was a very very bleak time in Britain I think worse than like you know all the strikes of the 70s and stuff it was a, a time of intense spiritual poverty but once again by 2000 and certainly in 2001 and certainly after 9-11 uh, that catapulted a lot of people into thinking hang on a second this is like this is like a movie this is so weird this is so wrong that it's almost like a clue. It's like a gift to say, yeah, there is something wrong. And it's encouraging the individual to do something about that, not to vote somebody in. That's nonsense. It's a complete waste of time, that. But to do something with your own consciousness, to say, you've got this thing in your head that you can transmit and receive. And consciousness, as I go into in the book, is like a field. It's not something you generate necessarily. It's something that you receive and transmit like radio waves in a way. But you have this capacity with your mind to know everything about what's going on and to know everything about all the other intelligences, all the other orders of uh, life in the universe, all the other kingdoms and realms and dimensions, this huge, enormous vista of existence which we don't know nothing about which we're asked just to look at the tiny little farty bits in our solar system we get these trifling nonsensical things from astronomers saying oh this is happening over there and this is happening and there's this thing going on over here and it, it doesn't really mean anything to people it's so distant from real life but when you become a person of wisdom and when you live as a person of integrity and a person of truth, you start to encounter that stuff for yourself. And as I say, the boundaries of perception draw back further and further and further. And you can see deeper. You can see more. And you're no longer just living in the same 3D nuts and bolts world. You can see around the corner. You can see a little bit more than other people can and other kinds of experiences which we call supernatural or paranormal or magical start to enfold themselves into your life and start to become part of your daily experiences because you've increased your capacity for consciousness more is going through your head you're not just 
you know, doing what the government and the mainstream education system is asking you to do and your employer is asking you to do. You're doing something different. You're doing something purer. And when you do that, as I say, the world permits you to see more of it. Well, I think a lot of human beings alive on planet Earth right now have known for a long time, perhaps all their lives, that something was wrong, but they couldn't put a finger on it. And 9-11 for me was a bit like, uh, just to mention the Matrix again, that bit where with the black cat and Neo does a double take. Right. And that was the moment when I, I realized, yeah, this is being projected into my head. And for people perhaps listening to this, uh, maybe finding it a talk of spirituality and mysticism and maybe struggling to get to grips with it, um, I would say perhaps they could look at some of the stuff that cutting edge science is telling us, because whether by accident or not, um, in the realm of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, I mean, I've read some mind blowing stuff recently of what's happening in the world of quantum computing. Some of these disciplines, I, be I believe they've had a peek behind a veil and maybe many others beyond that. But in some of these realms, we can begin to get an inkling of what else there might be out there and all around us, in fact. There is. And you can sum it up, I think, by saying that what a lot of quantum physics is doing is saying there's this other dimensional space where everything's connected and there's no time and space constraints there. And things can bilocate and duplicate and move faster than light and go forwards and backwards in time and transform their uh, shape and whatnot. And that realm is the real realm. And this that we're in is a projection of it, is a, a suggestion of it, is a theatre of it, if you like. And the importance of mysticism is that that observation was made about 5,000 years ago, uh, but it's made in a very poetic and very esoteric manner. And for a lot of people who need nuts and bolts, that's difficult to believe, difficult to look at, difficult to accept. But they're starting to tie up more and more. So the sort of pioneers who would go in and say, right, I'm going to say some things now. I don't know why I'm saying it. I don't necessarily have a lot of evidence for this, but this is the way I see it. When I sit down and look at some of the works um, today that come out, you know, popular science, popular quantum physics, admittedly, not the hard, you know, equation stuff, which probably would be a bit undigestible. But, you know, you get the gist of how magical this place is and what's going on. And it is a perfect mirror of, you know, even Victorian mysticism, a lot of what these people were saying, particularly in things like uh, Rosicrucianism and uh, theosophy as like mystical schools of people who would get together and think about how the world is, is created. And it does show the same thing, which is there is this higher dimensional space, which I call the 4D um, which the mystic would call, you know, the, the higher planes or the, uh, you know, some kind of mystical realm where you would astral project and all this stuff. And then there is this 3D. And the 3D really, as I say, is symbolic of the 4D. It's uh, a stage play based on what's happening really in the 4D. And quantum physics is saying the same thing. So a lot of the stuff that uh, we see in this world doesn't come from this world a lot of the resolutions to the problems in here don't uh, exist here. They exist from their origin, which is in the 4D. So the 3D emanates from the 4D. That's the point of this. And when you do that, when you see that, and you, you come across a, an event like uh, September the 11th, you look at it and say, that sort of doesn't make sense. And when you really scrutinize what went on, certainly what government's told us don't make sense again conspiracy element to that true it wasn't 19 arab hijackers i'm pretty um you know right arm i chopped my right arm off on that one i'm certain about that now i, I did a a 9-11 show which is on my website which people can go and have a look at and explore that with you know a couple of professor dudes and myself and a show host and we have a a sensible high level intelligent credible conversation about some of those issues the ramifications of 9-11 however not who did it how and why but the ramifications of it what it makes people do is very interesting because it is um a sort of threshold event that for a lot of people and it's like one of those situations where 
if you look closely at 9-11, it will change the way you feel about the world. If you don't look at 9-11 and decide not to do that, then you're hiding. And right now, people who are hiding from themselves and the world are going to be in trouble soon, real trouble. And 9-11 is one of those events where you can sort of uh, sort the wheat from the chaff in a way, because it is a gateway event. And me and some of my friends, we refer to it as a Stargate event, because once you go through that, you end up in a different place. You end up in a slightly different world, which at first is a bit weird, admittedly, but very quickly it becomes more exciting and deeper and above all truer, a very, very true world. And that changes all the rules straight away. And it, it leads into something that I've discussed before, which is there is sim- two kinds of ignorance. Simple ignorance, which is where you just don't know something. So if someone said to me, well, what happened on 9-11? And say, well... Uh, you know, this this happened and that happened and this technology was used and these, these things occurred. And they go, oh, I didn't know that. That's simple ignorance and we all have that. It's just stuff we don't know. Complex ignorance is a different thing and that's one of the big problems in uh, society today, which is people purposefully maintaining their own ignorance to say, look, I don't want to know, okay? I do not want to know about that. And people do that to protect themselves from change. So people who are unaccustomed to transformation and not happy with change which is an awful lot of people maintain this complex ignorance to say look here's the way i look at the world and i'm sticking to it now go away that the people who are doing that are going to end up in a lot of trouble soon and i think you're right i think if if somebody's not happy with spirituality and mysticism personally i think you're missing out because some of the biggest clues and answers are right in those realms Fine, go and look at physics, go and look at biology and chemistry and geology and goodness knows what. There's, there's answers and pieces of the jigsaw everywhere. Great, go and do whatever you want. But consistently, consistently through my journey, and I share this hand on heart, the more esoteric and mystical it is, and you have to, again, sort the wheat from the chaff because there's some crazy bastards out there who you just have to you know, close the book and think, that is nonsense. But when you find the real people, when you find the real stuff and people who were with high levels of honor, high levels of honor, going about this story of where we come from and what's going on and how long has this been occurring and what's the solution, those people are part of what we now call the ancient mysteries. And that is knowledge from the world before we knew it as it is today, the ancient world of which we have a line drawn that we don't know anything about. Some of the knowledge from that world leaked through and we have it now. And their state of conscious advancement was far higher than what we have now. And that's, again, a heretical notion. Forbidden knowledge is it's bullshit to some people. That isn't my experience. That knowledge is so powerful and so amazing that it's very carefully protected by these schools who have various initiations to allow you to see different bits of it. Because until you've reached a high moral, ethical, integral, sincerity standards, you're not fit to know what's going on, quite frankly. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's reasons for that initiation. Um, But that mystical study and again mysticism really just people who are, who are sitting down and asking those big questions and as many scientists know um if they you know telling the truth to themselves you don't have to go very far back before science and alchemy and mysticism and philosophy were one single discipline it's only in the last few hundred years we've separated them out go back far enough and it was very multidisciplinary it was very renaissance activity where you say, well, you can philosophize a bit and you can do some science, but until you bring in personal, mystical, shamanic study, you never really know. You've got to do it. You've got to go to the 4D. You've got to see it for yourself. And to use your reference to the Matrix, as Morpheus said, you can't be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. It's no use reading about it on a bit of paper. You have to go and take a look. And that's what the mystics did. They said, right, we have devised techniques where we can go and have a look at this thing. We can go into that other realm and take a look around. Again, in our world now, we're not allowed to think like that. That's fiction. Well, hand on heart, again, that is not fiction. That is more real than this. And that's where a lot of the answers lie. So the people who cling to the 3D, who are totally invested in this world, 
who are maintaining complex ignorance and don't want to know the truth about their sacred adventure on this planet are in for a, a nasty surprise, really. They'll, they'll be okay in the end, but it'll be a bumpy ride. For everyone else who's saying, look, there's something wrong and I want to know, and I'm prepared to do anything to know that, change myself, transform myself, be somebody different, do something different, live with more honor in my life, and that's very, very important aspect of it. You can't do it without honor. Uh, those people are going to have a huge springboard very soon as to a better way of existing. And that is a split that's occurring. And again, it's part of the transformation globally. It's part of the big strategy. And it's okay. In my view, everybody gets there in the end. But there is a very nice, excellent, uh, smooth route to it, which is dependent on your own sense of uh, discovery and your own willingness to transform, to be somebody a bit different every day, essentially. Now, at a basic level, human beings kind of want to know the answers. They want the jury to be back in and they want to know what's going on. This is reality. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I can do so that they can sleep at night. And this is where beliefs uh, come in because they're ultimately rooted in a desire to know. But having a lot of beliefs that are not uh, based in any sort of reality, whatever we perceive that to be, is not healthy because then people identify with their beliefs and find it very hard to change because it becomes part of who they are. And I believe that either we know things or we don't know them. Believing something is, is fairly useless. And in the book, you do, um, no, it's not, it concede is the wrong word, but you do uh, suggest that um, at one level, we may not know anything for sure, but that's actually, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's actually okay because on in this reality or perhaps in this density, to use your term, or in this dimension, we may not ever uh, know anything for sure, and that is okay. And that's what unsettles a lot of people, is do they just want to know what the answers are? But I found that as life is, even at a superficial level, seems to be nothing but uncertainty, however much we crave certainty, there's actually great adventure and excitement to be had in venturing into that uncertainty. Well, that's a very, very healthy perspective, and if only more people had that, we'd, we'd be doing a lot better. And it is, it is exciting, and it is interesting, and it's an experiment to say, let me try and live without belief for a week. Let me not try and believe in anything. And my proposal in the book is you don't need any beliefs in anything at all, period, ever. I also suggest to people that it's OK to say we don't know anything. You know, nobody really has the answers or whatever. And it's only from that starting point of saying, right, I'm not going to believe anything. Number one. Number two, I'm going to admit I am going to concede to myself that. I don't know anything. I don't actually know anything. Then you are then fit to start learning about what's true. Only from that point where you empty your cup can you then start to fill it with something meaningful. And it does require a lot of humility to say that, which is why science and mysticism, there's a, a bit of a schism between them because mystics kind of that I have uh, met in my life, modern mystics and some of the mystical aspects of what I do, there's no problem with me saying, oh, my God, you know that thing I said a year ago, it's complete nonsense. Sorry about that. Anyway, moving on. You know, I don't owe anybody anything. Nobody's sponsoring me. It doesn't matter if I get something wrong. I just think, crikey, that was stupid. Change it and move on. But if you've got big investments and you've got big sort of, um, you know, shoes to fill and you're sat in a university or there's somebody sponsoring you intellectually or financially or uh, even emotionally then you do have a lot to lose and you have to defend a certain point of view and maintain it even though it might not be right and that's dishonorable and that has to go in this process of unfoldment you can only do it with honor and sometimes that means you have to put your hand up and say i don't know about this however gnosis which is a, a better term to introduce is where you have a living knowledge of something to say i have been into another realm where i encountered x y and z i have that gnosis i have that living knowledge and whether we call that fact whether we call it fiction whether we call it this or that it doesn't matter i don't have to persuade anybody or prove anything to anyone i have no interest in doing that but i do have this gnosis this living knowledge and when you get very clear on that and very pure on that you start to realize that a lot of other people have it as well. And it's kind of the same thing with everyone else. And then you realize there's a universality to it. 
it's not just something occurring in your head it's very very true uh, and as I say, that truth expands as your consciousness expands. So as you become a better person, you see more and more truth and it distances itself from the mainstream view of reality, which is very untrue. So you have to take a big swallow and say, just because a lot of people believe it doesn't make it mean it's true. It really doesn't. So the way we see the world is fundamentally flawed. As, as this platform with lots of separate objects on it. That's how we see the world. That's how we are tutored in our physics as boys and girls at school and through our parents and teachers and whatnot. The world isn't a big platform with lots of separate objects in it. That's fundamentally incorrect. So right from the start, you have to uproot these very deep notions about how we perceive things. And for some people... Uh, Looking at quantum physics is a good way of doing that. For other people, it's philosophy. For other people, it's uh, spiritual texts. For other people, it's mystical texts. For other people, you know, it could be the examining the natural world. It could be anything. Go with what works for you. It doesn't really matter. But you have to uproot and unlearn a lot of things, and that that's a big ask again for a lot of people. If you have a creative spirit, and if you don't always seek closure on every single thing in your life, it becomes a little bit easier. So part of the unfoldment, part of the discipline of the unfoldment is to become comfortable with uncertainty, to think, look, we don't know, okay, but I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to behave in the best way that I can, and I'm going to stick to what's true, even though not many people might believe it in the mainstream. You know, we don't talk about the 4D world a lot in the mainstream, do we? And yet it's part of my daily life. And some of the smartest people I know who have very different views to me, we all agree that there is a, a surrounding realm that creates this realm. And it doesn't come from the 3D. It's not a physical structure at all. And some of the most powerful experiences in my life and in my friends' lives are not physical experiences. There's something different. And that becomes part of your reality. And that is a truer world. Yeah, well, we refer to this the, the idea of this reality, other reality, deeper reality, where this you know uh, level of reality may emanate from uh, with regard to the matrix the same thing applies to the just for popular ideas that people could begin to think about this around it the idea of the force in star wars uh, the idea of uh, ether um, it's in the story of king arthur as well the dragon's breath it is everywhere it is everything and it's just this universality and this idea that all is one um that the the information uh, suggesting this is all around us and, uh... Yeah, I mean, part of the problem with uh, people getting worried about mysticism and mystery school knowledge and whatnot is the language. Because if you read, like, uh, Gurdjieff or Blavatsky or Crowley or something, you, you've got these uh, mystics and occultists and whatnot. They use this very flowery language, and it's it's very unscientific, and it's very romantic in places. And you think, well, what on earth are they talking about? But as you say, they're talking about... Uh, leveraging what we might call in today's world the sort of quantum vacuum, the zero point field and a lot of uh, researchers who are looking into free energy devices are taking energy from this zero point field and saying you know what there's this infinite supply of energy in a surrounding dimension that does away with our need for any sort of fossil fuels ever again. And the mystics are like, yeah, we know about that. And actually, you can personally use it as well to do things. You can actually change things with it. But you have to do it in a certain way. And you can only do it with a certain kind of consciousness. You can't do it with a normal state of waking consciousness. You have to change your mode of consciousness to get into it. Just like, again, as your, your metaphor of Star Wars, the Jedis, what are they doing? They're changing the state of their consciousness to do stuff. So whether it's, you know, the, the Jedis or the, the evil guys or whatever, they are meditating, they're changing the vibration of the consciousness, they're changing the composition, the chemistry in the brain. They're doing something to their organic machinery to tweak it so that the consciousness that flows through it is of a different order. And once they've achieved that new frequency, as we might say, then they can tap into that zero-point field, that force, that ether, whatever... Uh, the chi as the chinese and whatnot call it and mm -hmm. it's it's all one thing and it's just the idea that there is this other realm that surrounds ours through which this one emanates from and ultimately gets all its power from and we can draw on that realm 
quite happily and naturally and organically in a, in a harmonious way. And we can also go to that realm for knowledge. And we can also go to that realm for some of the meanings of this realm. You can't find out the meaning of this realm from within it. You cannot know the 3D from within the 3D. That's the point of this. And that is the journey of the unfoldment in some ways is to say, well, don't take my word for it. Go and have a look. And here's some stories about people who've done it. Uh, there's some accounts of it. And there's some ways of thinking about it. So the the key thing for me, the philosophical angle, is the first step is you have to change the way you think about the world that you're in. And you can do that very quickly and easily as an experiment, you know, almost as an actor. Say, well, let's pretend that you weren't who you normally are. You were someone else and you thought in a different way. Let's do that for an hour or a day or a week. And as you go through that experiment, you realize that there is a totally different way of seeing this world. And just with one perspective shift, it physically changes the world itself. Now, there's a chapter in the book which um, stands alone quite nicely, just as a little world unto itself but it also has potentially profound ramifications at the way we think about reality and the world around us and it's that the one where you discuss um tulpa or golems uh basically an order of beings walking among among us um, who are not quite what they seem i think that's your your phrase now i find this to be quite mind-blowing because i'd heard of the concept of golem and tulpa before and you can basically give us a little background to what that is but the context that you put it in and the you think you call your suggestion incendiary, but I don't care about that. I found your suggestion in that chapter absolutely mind blowing. And literally, I wanted to go out and walk down the street with that in mind and, and just see what happened. So perhaps you can say something about that. Well, in Tibetan Bon Buddhism, um, there is the uh, reality and the knowledge that before um, popular Buddhism came to it, they had a very um, unusual shamanic tradition, which is very pure. I say unusual only in that it didn't fit into Buddhism as we understand it today. And we tend to think of Buddhism as this, you know, kind of cooler version of, you know, a mainstream religion that's maybe a bit better than Christianity. When Buddhism came to Tibet, it was just as destructive and stupid as when Christianity came to Europe in that it was very empirical it was very imperialist it crushed every other indigenous shamanic tradition so all the druidry that we had in uh, gaul and in britain was crushed by christianity because it made a threat against it uh, just by its very existence before that was crushed in tibet um, there were an order of uh, spiritual adepts there who would create thought forms just like you would create a thought form if i ask you to think of a lemon And now lots of people have just thought of this little yellow fruit, this citrus thingy. And that's a thought form, right? What the the Bon spiritual adepts would do is infuse that thought form with a particular order of consciousness where it became real. And what they would do is create a thought form that was like a little person. And that person would be uh, created to go out into the world and help do things carry wood get water look after the animals tend to the farm whatever and it was like bringing in you know a sort of unpaid helper (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it was a total thought form it wasn't a sold being it wasn't somebody from source as we would say in mystical traditions they didn't emanate from the divine uh, directly they emanated from a human being's consciousness and that is what they called a tulpa t-u-l-p-a a tulpa And um, there are many suggestions in many uh, ancient mystery school traditions that suggest that tulpas are very widespread. For example, in Scandinavia, in my research, I didn't have a lot of time to go into this in the book, but I mention it. um, There were a lot of these things going on and they've now been mythologized as different things, as like gnomes and pixies and goodness knows what. But if you look at Finnish and Norwegian and Swedish and Danish uh, uh, mysticism and uh, you comb that very carefully and you scrutinize that very carefully, you see accounts, particularly, of course, in those times, medieval times of uh, rural peoples uh, with, you know, quite hard lives based on agriculture of creating beings 
uh, tulpas who would help in their local environments. And it was very common. It went on all the time. And these little dudes would go about and do, as I say, quite uh, mundane tasks to help around the, the, the business and the home. Um, and in many cases, those tulpas would then wander off. And in some cases, they would ask permission from their creator, the human, to say, look, I think I'm done now. Is it okay if I go and go about my own life and go about my own business? And he's like, yeah, okay, then good luck. See you. And then you're left with the situation where there is a proportion of the population who isn't human and who don't have souls and who are actually purely thought forms. And there's a whole science behind this. And I mentioned some of the, the uh, Hebrew mystical traditions, uh, some of the Judaic views on this, where they talk about golems, where they create something out of clay, which is an alchemical symbolic term, which means um, the primary substance of reality. They don't actually mean clay. They mean a physical uh, aspect of one's own divinity. So you take your own vital spark, cut a tiny piece of it off, and say, there you go, I'm going cre- to conjure up a new life form into existence. It doesn't have a soul, but it has, in every other respect, it's a, it's a person. And there are many, many accounts of this, and I go through this in, in the book, and I would say very capably and very truly and honorably that Jesus did this a lot. When he brought food and when he brought wine and when he multiplied things and when he, uh, you know, <laughs> many sort of supernatural things that he did were not necessarily anything else than thought forms that he infused with his own divinity, which, of course, being the guy he was, let's say he was as we think he was, was a supremely divine person. So his thought forms were very, very powerful. They had a consensus reality set against them. My suggestion in the book is that there are a lot of those entities still walking around, and some of them you might pass in the street, and you wouldn't necessarily know. And not only that, but they don't necessarily know either. And it's a very... Uh, philosophically interesting idea as well as it being paranormally supernaturally interesting I think oh that's unusual that's okay yes it is unusual yes it is spooky but philosophically isn't it interesting to think well are those people necessarily any less than you would you treat them differently are they uh, deserving of the same rights and privileges as any other life form or what and what is their path in life what are their aims what are they trying to do and so examining the tulpa by examining the idea and the reality of the tulpa and again i give lots of uh, references that people can look up within the text to say go and check this out yourself it, you'll be surprised how real it is and as i say rabbis in new york only a few decades ago were still absolutely claiming the reality of this and saying we know how to do it we know where they are we have evidence of it we've seen it you know very very powerful sensible credible scholarly men in New York City just, you know, a few decades ago, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, we're talking about this in great detail. And of course, everybody's ignoring them because it's heretical to talk about that. They think they're just mad. The interesting thing in considering that is to say, even amongst our own uh, population, there is potentially a proportion of it that is not human in the sense that we know they look human, like in the Matrix, but they're not. And not only that, but that proportion could be surprisingly high. It could be very high. And there is a suggestion in the book, and to be honest, it's a philosophical suggestion rather than a a practical suggestion because it's how we think about it more importantly right now than what we do about it. But how we think about it, here's an idea. What if everybody who is unconscious and who is determined to remain unconscious is doing so because there's no point in doing anything else, i.e. they're not human beings. There are as many subjects and interrelated areas in the book that we still haven't gone into as we already have. So perhaps we should begin to sort of wind it up for today. Uh, But to put all of this in a larger context, which I think is important, um, you've referred to what we're living in right now, the unreality of it and the fraudulent nature of it and the un untrue nature as the distortion and you say that we have a uh, a once in 25,000 year opportunity to exit this distortion a reference to the the times in, in which we're living the tumult that we're seeing and but ultimately the the positive things that can come 
from that. Uh, so perhaps you could just um, conclude by saying something about all of this in the larger context and specifically what the, the 25,000 year um, a, a rhythm pattern rather refers to. Yeah, sure. It, in the book, there are these you know 23 different sections, chapters that say, here's a different perspective on the world. Here's some subject matters that you may not be familiar with, um, some philosophical, some esoteric, some psychological, some emotional, some paranormal, and they all tie together. And at the end of it, essentially you're left with, uh, I think, a very um, true uh, sensation that the world is very mysterious and very deep, much, much more so than we thought. If you look carefully, again, uh, our spiritual ancestry, our wisdom heritage, if you want to put it plainly, there is a clear uh, cycle of time which uh, right now is coming to a peak. And it's not necessarily end of the Mayan calendar scenario or change in the Mayan calendar is more appropriate as they actually describe it themselves. It's um, an apex, if you like. It's, it's the top curve on the graph to say here is the moment of maximum dynamism, of maximum creativity. It's kind of like, you know, um, where I don't want to get into talking about heavy metal with you because we'll, we'll do that offline. But <laughs> it's kind of like where a really excellent heavy metal band like Led Zeppelin suddenly make um, three astonishingly good albums. And on that peak, they're capable of so many amazing things. And that is, that is where we find ourselves at the peak of our creative potential right now. So if you look to the, to the left, it's very dark and very stupid very destructive and bleak and violent. And if you look to the right, it's extremely deep and lush and um, harmonious. And it's filled with opportunity and excitement and adventure. And both those things are totally real and they're part of the dynamic, part of the polarity structure, which asks you to decide on what that central point is because you can't ignore either of them and they both have a part to play. And what they're asking you to do is find the center point, essentially. It's find the point of balance, find the point of maximum equilibrium in your own life to say, I need to understand the shadow to understand the world, and I need to understand the light to understand the world. But right now, for the purposes of evolution and growth and advancement, I have to accept responsibility that is totally within my own hands my outcome is totally self-determined nobody's going to do it for you no savior is going to come and do it for you no politician is going to come and do it for you any god any supreme being is going to look down and believe me they're going to say i want everyone to do it for themselves and this is a point where there is a split as we said there is a bifurcation and it's it's impossible to not observe that and it means that there's this tremendous uh, energetic momentum right now and it's going to fire people into darkness or into light and my suggestion is that at that point of the split is where you evolve is where you understand and you don't you don't really need to worry about what's going to happen how it's going to be what's going to occur to the planet when is it going to be it's happening right now as far as i can see it's not like a, a light switch moment where everything changes. It's, it's a curve. You know, there's no point on it as such. There's a curve. It's not like a, you know, a mountain point where there's this specific thing. You say, oh, it's December the 21st, 2012. That might, interesting things might happen then, but that's not it. That's just another point on the graph. What we focus on is to say, um, the universe is going through some very unique physical changes. A lot of things are heating up. We're getting exposed to uh, energy from uh, the center of the galaxy that's unique, that we've never been to uh, before, or certainly not for the last 25, 26,000 years. And physically, that's doing something different. The sun is doing something different. People are behaving differently because of that. It's affecting every structure within that system. And a lot of the solar cultists and solar worship, when you strip away the symbolic, exoteric 
layer of the language, they're observing the same thing, saying there's something about the sun. The sun holds the key to a lot of this stuff. Observing the sun and observing the um, esoteric meanings of the sun and what that is and what actually physically it is, because I don't think we've got it right, what it is, gives a clue as to what's happening. And if you maintain your light, and let us say in the same way that the sun maintains its light, and those two things are not as metaphorical as you might think, I'm suggesting they're actually very literal, then you're going to do okay. So if you're in shadow and you're asked to pass through the stargate of the sun, you're not going to do too well. If you're in light, if you're in transparency and total openness and total growth and you pass through the stargate of the sun, then you're going to do very well. In fact, it's going to launch you into what you always wanted to do and always wanted to be and always were going to be there. It's very, very important, this. And so now is the time, if you're going to make changes, use your diligence and conscientiousness, of course. Don't leave anyone in the lurch. If you've created responsibilities, attend to them. Do the right thing. But within reason, people who need to make changes and want to take some calculated risks, now is the time to do it. Now is the time to do it. There's not been ever been a better time, really, because there's so much dynamism in this world at the moment. There's so much creativity bubbling under the surface. The universe is just waiting for people to take ownership of themselves and to take hold of their own sovereign authority and claim their independence and say, look, I am me. I'm doing this. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be. This is how I'm going to conduct myself. This is what I'm going to experience. The universe is actively supporting that energetic shift at the moment more than anything else in my view. And I see it every single day. So anyone who is considering making a move in their life, now is the time to do it. Well, Neil, your book, uh, The Unfoldment, which is uh, probably the most fascinating one I've read so far this year, is available at Amazon, of course, and lots of other popular outlets. Um, Perhaps you'd care to tell the listeners about your website or sites, any other publications you have available, um, anything you're working on, or um, I know you sometimes give talks and presentations, just anything you'd like to put out there. Sure. Well, it's dead easy. Uh, If you go to neilkramer.com, everything is available from there you can get the book from there you can get dvds and audio books from there i also have a collection of my essays and writings in audio book format read by me which is available for sort of instant download uh, there's a dvd of workshops many hours of material on there there are essays to read on that website there's an archive of all the interviews i've done over the last few years on there So anyone who's interested in these subjects, and I always try and pick out different elements of things, but give this overarching philosophical perspective of it, you will find it there. Um, So neilkramer.com, everything's in one place. Well, Neil Kramer, thank you very much for joining us today on legalizefreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. I enjoyed it. Well, that's it for another week. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please check out the website where you'll find an archive of broadcasts on a range of equally fascinating topics. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.